real quickly that I'm going to shed on you. This might be a little hard, but. <laughs> One thing that's very important with a temper, it must be painted on a solid surface. You can't paint a temper on a flexible surface like a canvas because the paint would eventually break off. Um, in the Renaissance time, they normally painted on solid wood panels, either birch or poplar. Um, and in fact, well, I say solid wood, I mean they were solid wood panels, but if they wanted to make something large, they actually had a piece, sections of wood together. So many times if you see a painting from that period, you can actually see where the panels have warped a little bit over the years because of storage and humidity. Currently, what I normally paint on and what most egg temper painters use is either masonite or an MDF board because it, it's just an easier surface and it won't warp in the same way. But you still have to have a gesso surface. Now when I say gesso, I'm not referring to the type of gesso that you see like for sale in gallon cans in the art store, which is essentially acrylic paint. You really need to make the gesso the original way that they made it, which is the way I still make it. I'm just going to show you also. So this is basically a masonite panel and it's cradled on wood. You have to cradle it because when you put so many layers of gesso, it'll warp. A painting this size would warp. So that just frames it out, keeps it from warping. And after, once I have the panel actually mounted on the wood, this might have I, I feel like I'm getting really loud. All no, no, you're fine. Fine? Okay, yeah. good. Then you make the gesso. Gesso consists of marble dust or powdered chalk or a combination thereof, and you mix it into rabbit skin glue. And you have to do this over heated, you know, at a low heat. You have to stir it constantly. And you apply approximately seven to eight layers, sanding in between layers to get this beautiful, it's just a velvety, beautiful, absorbent surface that the egg temper takes to. And that's really, that's really the best surface to do in egg temper. And I've heard of people using clayboard, etc., but I think that a pure gesso surface is really the only way to go. I'm just gonna... Put that back. examples, different colors. My favorite source of pigments is like Kremer pigments in New York City. David and Daniel Smith, um, I think they're in Seattle. They have excellent pigments also. Sinopia or Sinele are other companies that make powdered pigments. The one difference between the pigments today compared to what they probably used in the Renaissance is that they, they are so finely ground today that it's much easier for the artist. In the old days, they actually had to grind the pigments by hand with a glass muller. I don't know if you've ever seen an example of that. But I, you know, you rarely have to do that today because the pigments are so refined. So actually, to create the pigment, you have the powder, you add egg yolk, and you add a little water. And that's the entire way you make the pigment. What I do, I, I take one extra step, and most people, most contemporary egg temper artists do this. Rather than start from scratch with powder every single day, it's easier to make a little paste of the powder and water and keep it in the jar. It just eliminates one little step, and it also makes it safer to handle. Because although egg temper paint, um, egg temper paints, they're not toxic when you're using them once they're wet. But in powdered form, theoretically, if you inhale them, you have to be a little bit careful. So it's just a safer step, and it makes it that much simpler. I've already mixed up a few paints, but I thought I'd show you the whole process, just so you can. Let's start with the 
fresh. So of course you do this um, every day. You can't keep the paints because it's fresh egg. Usually I'm very good at not breaking the give, but <laughs> just keep my fingers crossed here. And it's, you know, it's more or less the same technique you would use cooking, if anybody's ever separated yolks for that reason. The only difference is after I do basically get the white out, I usually roll it around on a paper towel a little bit just to remove that last bit of, um, you know, white. I don't know if you can see this, <laughs> but I've just like rolled it around on a paper towel and then you just burst the sack and get the yolk, the pure yolk out. And then you're just left with a sack which you can get rid of. And I usually save the egg whites for some other cooking purpose, but <laughs> my dog, I used to mix it in with my dog's food. It's supposed to be good for him. So now you just have the pure egg yolk. You mix a little water in. Excuse me, that container with the paper towels right in front of your hands. Yeah, move, move that. This? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, sorry guys. That was just my eggs, yeah. <laughs> So I'm just adding in a little water, and there's no tried and true, I mean, I've read like different percentages and whatever, but I think you just really want to get it to a consistency that's a little, you know, a little thinner, so it's easier to work with. I like to keep my egg yolks on the thick side because you can always add extra water later. So I've mixed up a few colors ahead of time, but I'm going to, right now I'm going to use a burnt umber, and this is from Daniel Smith, I, I really like their burnt umber, so. and again, this is just the dry powdered pigment in water. You can keep, I mean in this form you can keep them however long you want, and if they dry out you can just add more water to them, so. I'm just taking a little bit of the Taking it out. I had mixed up some egg earlier, but I wanted to, well, it doesn't matter which one. And you just add a little like, egg to it. And again, you know, I, you know, there are different people who have, there are formulas you can follow. There are, you know, if you look even on the internet, there's plenty of places where you can see different recipes. But I've just found that the safer thing is you just eat, every pigment's a little different. When you handle it, you get to know more or less the consistency you want. And what I like to do is keep my pigments at this point in a fairly thick form. And then I just, as, you know, as I vary, I just add a little extra water to them. The water is eventually going to evaporate. So that, you know, that's a variable that can change. But you want to make sure you have enough egg in it to bind it. And that is, um, if you put too much egg, it'll get almost a waxy look. If you have too little egg, it's not going to stick on the thing. And this is something that just, you know, it comes with time. You just get the feel for it. Every pigment seems to require, in my opinion, a little bit of, it's different, you know, the amount of egg that every pigment requires. So I don't think you can really just go by a, you know, a specific formula. And I wanted to mix up one more color here, and then we'll get started. <clears throat> By the way, if anybody is interested in um, 
playing around. This is a nice Floridian. If anybody's interested in sort of experimenting with egg tempera, and you don't want to invest in, you know, getting all the dried pigments and everything, if you take regular watercolor and add A to it, you can get a reasonable facsimile. It won't be exactly like A tempera, but it would give you a feel for what it would be like to work with A tempera. So that's an inexpensive way to, you know, get your feet wet in it if you feel like giving it a try. Now sometimes these tend to like thicken up, so I'm just stirring it a little. As I said, even if they dry out, you can reconstitute them by adding a little extra water. Exactly how they made pigments in the old days. As I said, the only difference might be that I think they probably had a, you know, they didn't have as a refined powdered pigment, so they ground them, they had to go through the process of grinding them more. But that really, I rarely had to do that with a pigment. I haven't really done that much on so that you can see me going in. 
And I'm just gonna, I'll just paint for a while. Um, at the end, we can, you know, I can certainly field more questions. But um, let me just get started. The other um, thing that I like to do when I paint, and this again, this is not a hard and fast rule, it's just my own technique for painting. I tend not to mix my colors on the palette. I usually keep my colors very pure and let them mix on the actual panel. And I think what that does is enhance that real shimmery quality. And if I could like um, to use an example, of, you know, if you if you had, if you were using regular paints and you mixed blue and yellow, you'd get a green. But it would be a different effect if you put a real thin wash of blue and then put a real thin wash of yellow over it. It would still be green, but it just looks a little different. So it would be similar to glazing in oil paint. So what, I, what I'm doing is just, I'm adding a little water and thinning out that initial mix that I used there. Now if you can see like this a little bit, the eyebrow, the eye, that's, I mean the eyebrow is just blue. This one I already started working on. I'm just, and in the lips you can still see a lot of the blue shadows. So I'm going to go back in with some red to counter that. The blue being the cool, the red being the warm, and that. Basically what I'm doing also, I'm putting a fair amount of paint on the brush, but before I actually start painting in there, I'm wiping it. And at the same time that I do that, I kind of fan the bristles out, so it's kind of a wide stroke. And at this point in the painting, since it's fairly early on, and I mean this is still early in the painting, um, you have a little bit more freedom to experiment and put in different colors because you'll, put, you'll be putting so many more layers on later. Yeah. <laughs> 
No, it's like one minute cycle. You know, it's, it's kind of red there. I use a lot of white at the very beginning of a painting because the white looks very like a nice thick builds up the body. So I'm going to go in with a little white. I'm mixing a tiny bit of ochre in there just so that it's not super harsh white. And in a sense, it's almost like a modified cross strip. You sort of, like I, I fan the brush out, I'm putting it on fairly dry, but I'm trying to alternate my strokes back and forth, almost like a cross hatch, but a little wider. And I also, when I do my strokes, I'm thinking about the contours that I'm following, so I'm almost like sculpting the shape out. And you do, I mean, of course, this is, you know, back and forth, back and forth, it's almost like a dance. The layers dry extremely quickly, which is, I mean, that's like the, the lovely part with a temper. You put so many layers on, but they dry within seconds. So you can keep going back and forth. Within the course of a day, I could easily apply 100 layers. Um, <coughs> Now I can counter some of that redness with a little viridian. I'm going to put it on a little thinner. Because the paint's translucent, every layer, I mean, you're going to be covering it up, and yet every layer underneath has a little bit of effect on the next layer you're going to put on. So, in the ultimate end, I think if you, I mean, if you look closely at some of my paintings in the show, you get the overall effect of, you know, it's flesh color, but if you look closely, you actually can see blues and reds and greens and every little layer that bounces. And the theory is that, you know, all these layers are going to bounce off of each other, bouncing off the gesso background, and create that luminous effect. Trying, you know, it's a little, I'm trying to speed up a little bit <laughs> so you don't all die of boredom, but to give you an idea of what um, the technique is. And actually, you do, I mean, you put the strokes on fairly fast, and if you notice, like, well, as opposed to oil painting, where you would have the time to keep manipulating the paint once it's on and make your shading in a different way. Here, you're just applying dry layers, and this is why they feel it's a linear technique. It's almost like drawing with paint. You're just having to create your shadow by layer upon layer, and almost like sort of like sculpting. It feels like sculpting it a little bit. Then another thing that I do after I, you know, I work with like a thicker stroke, a darker stroke. Now I'm going to take some yellow ochre, and I'm going to create a wash. Oops. I'm going to add quite a lot of water. And I always try to keep some really clean water around, you know, like the one that you sort of clean your brush in and the other one for doing the washes and stuff.
When I do washes, I use a fairly big size brush. These are, I think they're called, I think the brand is Cornell Moths. And I'll actually do washes over whole areas. And again, I'm using usually pure color, and it's like back and forth, back and forth. Thicker, darker, thicker strokes, different colors, and then alternating it with washes. And you just keep going back and forth like that again and again and again, and it builds it up. Every time you put a wash over it, it almost, I would say it like unifies colors underneath and kind of smooths them out. But then you want to keep the texture, so it's a dance. You know, you're playing it back and forth. And at the beginning, you know, you feel, you know, you're painting, you're painting away, and you're going, oh, and that's But eventually, if after you get, you know, 100 or so layers on it, it starts to, it really starts to come together, where it's just, you're putting on a layer, and it's as if the underpaint is just absorbing it. And it's really hard to, you know, to describe it. I don't think you're going to be able to see it tonight, but... When you're doing it, trust me, you know, it, it really, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to go over with a wash, over everything, this light yellow wash. And I'm just, you know, it's hard, again, it's just so you get the feel for it after a while. I'm putting a lot of, a lot of liquid on the brush, but I'm taking it, I'm taking quite a bit of it off. And one thing when you do a wash, you don't want to stop. I mean, you don't want to, if you try to, like, if you miss a spot or something and you try to go back, you're just going to pick up the paint at the knee. So you've just got to keep moving, hope for the best. <laughs> and you know, if you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world because you've got another hundred layers. <laughs> Feel like I got a little heavy there. I'm just trying to. A lot of times, if I'm doing a wash this big, like if I was in my studio, I probably wouldn't be doing it up on the easel. I'd probably lay the painting down to do it because it, you know, so it wouldn't run. But for the sake of making the demonstration, now I don't know if it's possible if you can actually see where the wash is kind of changing the color at all. Can you? Yes. Okay. Because it's like, you can actually, like, especially when you've got, you know, really good daylight and stuff, you can just see that. Now, of course, I didn't quite make enough paint up, which is, you should really always be generous when you're making up a wash. And I can actually see from my angle, like that last stroke I did, so I'm going to be careful not to, I'm just going to move on from there. <coughs> now, and even though here I'm putting yellow over blue, but it's all, like, and that'll build in, and then I'll go back, and, you know, you can always build up the blues again a little bit. Another brush I like to use, and it, this dries very fast, but when you're doing a wash, sometimes because it's wetter, just to be on the safe side before, so you don't, the one thing that egg temper does, if you paint and the other paint underneath it, if that layer hasn't really dried, you'll pick up paint from the bottom layer. So I'll just hit it with an air dryer really quick. I want to make sure that I'm not going to pick up anything, you know. Now I'll put another, what I'll try now, I'm going to put a viridian over that red, and you should be able to see that would be quite a nice little effect, too. So again, I'm going to make a wash from my thick paint. So I'm putting some of the thicker paint in. And in this case, I think I'm going to add a little white into the viridian, just to give it that little slight bit more body, but it's still going to be a wash, it's still going to be thin. 
My main rule of advice to anybody, if you're actually seriously going to get into egg temper, is not be afraid of it. It seems like an intimidating medium, but you know, just just go for it. Don't worry about it. You can always say to me, "Well, what color do you I put next, and then what color?" Any color. Try it. it you know. <laughs> I have. I use. Um, I love mixing turquoise and orange. You can just like. I think the main thing to keep in mind is warm, cool, warm, cool, warm, cool. That's how you get that shimmer. So now what I'm going to try to do now, I don't really want to put this, um, I'm going to go just switch to a slightly smaller brush. I don't really, in this case, want this viridian, this green, to go over his face. Because I want to keep that really light, like part of the space, and I don't want like a green tint in there, at least not in an uncontrolled way. So I'm just going to do the green over the red background and try to just, I'll just sort of stop around the face. It might look a little rough at this point, but ultimately, I think, you know, as you keep working it, you'll smooth it out. And It's a little tough because I've got this thing on the top. So like I said, I don't care if I go over a little bit of the hair, but I don't really want it to go over the skin tone too much. And again, you can see I got a little heavy handed there on the edges, but it'll be okay. Now what I'm going to do now, I have this, this area in here, I'm going to go in with a little umber and see if I can like pull up those shadows a bit. today I was putting in some white highlights in the hair to kind of bring thickness and a little more body. So I think I'm gonna... Now another brush that I love to use, this is actually a makeup brush. <laughs> But it's really nice, and it's kind of flared out already, like sort of a little, so that's like one of my favorite secret weapons. <laughs> now, I'm just going to go over the hair again, kind of a wash. The white underneath is kind of going to pick up the lighter brown.
the lip, as you can still see, has a lot of the blue, that really Prussian blue shown in there. So I'm going to kind of go with that with the umber, which is essentially warm. <coughs>
Do I work? How many hours? No, day? I like well because for one thing, I mean, partly because it's so much trouble to set up your paints and like mix them up. If you're not able to at least put in three or four hours, it doesn't even seem worth it to get started. I personally am pretty disciplined, and I, I just get so wrapped up in it that I'll work probably you know straight through from like. 9 or 10 in the morning till at least 6 or 7 at night. I do like to work in natural light as much as I possibly can. So I'm not too big at working like, you know, after the sun goes down. But yeah, I'm pretty disciplined. <laughs> I was a little confused about gesso. Is gesso the powdered pigment? Is no, let me, let me just quickly go over that again. Gesso is a combination. If you're talking about the genuine gesso, marble dust, or powdered chalk, and they're available at any of these art stores, like Daniel Smith sells it, whatever, and rabbit skin glue. And you have to heat the rabbit skin, skin glue up in a double boiler with some water. There's a specific formula. I can't remember it off the top of my head. You can find it. It's on the web in many places. And then you slowly, slowly, as you have like this double boiler of the rabbit skin glue that's melted in you know, water, you sift this marble dust in. And you just do it real slowly so it's real creamy consistency. And at that point, once it's a creamy consistency, rabbit skin glue, water, and marble dust, that's what you use to paint on that your dressing. And you put about seven or eight layers on it. I'm so confused though. You're talking about using the egg tempera. When do you use the gesso? Oh, the gesso is just the coating. That's just the board. That's before you ever start painting. That That's the just to create your ground. Yes, I'm I sorry. Yeah. Before yeah. you even before you even get near paint, right? Oh, so that in it's itself it's is a whole process. I mean, that's like a whole ritual. You can buy ready-made gesso boards though, and there are some. You know, there are some good companies. There's one in Santa Fe. I know of, I can't think of the company name, but I mean, it, um, there are some ready-made gesso panels that are available. Yes, thank you. Hi. Hi, Liz. Um, your gesso, how long does it take? I assume it dries for you an instant. The gesso? Or how long, each layer? Oh, gesso, I'd say it's about a half hour or so for the layer to dry, and you have to put them on you have to devote a day to doing gesso panels because you can't like start it and then like leave it and go back two hours later and put your next layer on. They have to be really consistently timed, otherwise they'll crack. Yeah. 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 Yes, no, I mean I don't know too much about that, but yeah, they absolutely there is that's a process that's, you know, it is possible. I don't know too much about doing it. Yeah. Is pumice the same as the marble dust? Excuse me? Is pumice the same as the marble dust? I don't think so. Uh, no, the marble dust is something different. Isn't it? I don't know. Does anybody know that? Pumice. We didn't hear the question. Oh, she wanted to know if pumice was the same as marble dust. As far as I know, it's not the same at all. White, well, whiting is just like the general term that they use that encompasses marble dust and um, the chalk I was talking about, like whiting is just sort of like a generalized term for that, yeah. Yeah? Um, when you finish this, mm -hmm. will we do, can, can well, I, will anybody still be alive? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <or no? laughs> will we be able to see what, now that we've seen you do this stage, will we be able to see the, a, a copy of the, uh, well, see the original as well as the finished product? <laughs> well, I can put it on my website. All right. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Uh, what kind of board do you use instead of the canvas? Instead of what? Instead of the canvas. I use I used to use masonite, but now I use MDF panel, which is essentially like a variation on masonite. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Along the way, I've learned that you shouldn't use um, uh, chlorinated water. Well, I have well water, so that's good. But actually, when I'm at home, I, I usually use distilled water. Yeah. 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 
is there a protective coating or a varnish like you would apply to a book? It depends. You can. In, in my show, there are some, you have examples of both. You don't have to. If you finish an egg temper, I mean, they're amazingly resilient. We have them from the Renaissance, right? Egg temper itself will um, cure, they call it. After about, to fully cure, it takes about a year. But even after two or three months, it will basically cure and harden. And it's, you know, it's the similar analogy would be if you've ever like left an egg on a plate and tried to get it off the next day. That stuff is like rock. They're incredibly durable. I rather like an unvarnished egg temper surface because it has such a unique velvety quality. And if, if you look at my show, um, I think Candyland is not varnished. Um, I'm trying to think. Rainbow Girl's not varnished. Um, the Night Pool is not varnished. However, there's nothing wrong with varnishing a paint. The thing that the varnish does, um, it sort of saturates the colors a little bit more. So they seem a little darker. If, you, if you're doing a paint that has a lot of dark in it, I think the varnish helps it because it just kind of makes the darks a little healthier. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was fortunate enough to go see the Wyatt's show mm -hmm. a number of years ago. And, um, granddaughter gave us a talk and, oh, nice. and she, yeah it was, it was just great and and I'm thinking of what you're doing there her, her statement was um, that he definitely worked flat he had several tabletops and oh, yeah. on soft horses and the nature of the material when it got to be a point where he couldn't do any work on one piece he had about three or four all yeah, I mean, and really. I was asked do you sometimes work that way where when you yeah. kind of reach the point of the one and you just need to have it Stop for a while, but you turn to a second piece, or do you like working just on one until you get it to a certain point? I've tried. I've tried to have like several pieces going at once, and what always happens to me is that I just I get so wrapped up in one that I just I I've just been not successful at trying to run several pieces at once. I think I just have such an emotional involvement with that piece that I just get into it. But I definitely do step away for a couple of days now and then, like during the process, so that you get like a fresh look at it. Yeah. So, the painting is all apart. The end of the book or the yellow is cast for them? Because they no, them. no. That you think like that the egg in there somehow would give them a yellowish cast? No, they don't. And the other thing about egg temper painting is that um, especially like unvarnished. Oil paintings over time will actually yellow naturally. Egg tempers colors remain true. They don't do that yellowing thing. It's interesting to me. I don't quite understand the chemistry of that. But yeah? Is there any reason why you never put like a light reflection in your eyes of your models? Um, I do do, well, I, I, I don't, what, you like that little glint of light yeah. thing? I don't know. I just don't like that. I think it's sort of too hallmark. I don't know. <laughs> I just, it's too cute for me. But I, you know, no. I try to, like, give them a different type of high. I mean, I definitely highlight them. But. Um, how do you attach the MVF on the sweatshirt? Oh, with glue and oh. plant it. Plant it, glue it, yeah. Like wood glue or? I use wood glue. Yeah. Yes. I just have a, a trouble getting my mind wrapped around the fact that an egg, that egg, an egg yolk is used. And I, I just wonder, going back, that you mentioned the word chemical. Uh, so I'm thinking that at some time it was a chemical research of some sort or experiment that uh, painters were. How they doing. found it like in the first How place? They, came to use an egg yolk. Yeah, you know, I, I really don't, I could not answer that. I know that they have examples of egg temper even being used in like Egyptian times. Yeah, so I really, I don't know, it's interesting. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. together at some point, but I don't have anything planned right now. If any of you are interested in the possibility of doing, like, it would, uh, I like to do a workshop that has to really be at least five days, because you just, as you can see how time-consuming it is, 
to really get the feel for it. But I don't have it planned right now. But if, if anybody's interested, just go to my website. You can like send me an email, and I'll keep you know I'll keep you on a list. And when I get around to getting that organized, I'll let you know for sure. What's yeah. your website? Um, my website it's madeasmithart.com. <laughs> <laughs> A painting this size can easily take two to three months. Um, I mean, that's one of the problems with a temper. My production is so low, you know. A painting, even the smaller ones, I probably most of the time spend at least a month on. And how do you know when you say, okay, I've done a stuff? It's always hard. It's hard, you know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, I try to just, I try to rein it in. I try to say, I, you know, you don't know. I guess it's just a feeling to develop. But you know, there have been examples, there have paintings where I felt like I've taken them too far. Because I really don't want to take them, you can take them to the point where it's so unbelievably, like, you know, photorealistic. But I really personally like that where you can still see some of the texture. So, you know, the more you keep putting layers on, the smoother and smoother it gets. I sort of like, Stop and still have that texture. Yeah. Did you, uh, when you're working with the wash, are you putting egg in the wash? Or the yes, no, it's the, the wash is the exact, like you saw that I mixed up, I have those little wells. I'm just simply putting more water. It's water the egg has to be in everything because that's the binder. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Jeff. How are you doing? Jeff Gola, a great egg temple artist. Do you listen to um, any music or anything on those long, long days? <laughs> oh, yes. In fact, tonight I thought it would be so cool if I could have my soundtrack blasting while I painted, but I'm sure not everybody would appreciate it. We could have done that too. Choice. I usually listen to music, and my other, my other um, thing now is books on tape. I try to, like, I'm trying to get the classics and also paint at the same time, too, so birds with me. I, you know, I just have to admit, that makes me think of something that, there's, if anybody wants to like read a book about egg temper that I just think is the coolest book, it's Robert, the Robert Vickery book, which I think is out of print, I'm not sure, but you can still it get it, and I know they have a copy in the library. It is so wonderful, and one of the things that I love so much is that he's so down to earth, he realizes that, you know, there's long, tedious periods of doing this, and he actually says in his book, what he likes to have on the TV in the background when he's back. <laughs> and I thought that was just so like honest and charming that he would like, have his have his shows on anyway. Yeah. What do you do with your work? How much of it do you go start with the blueprint? How much do you just throw away and let it let it evolve over time? You know, I always have to have something to start with because it's just not the type of medium like you know, that you can just mush around, like, like get in there and start throwing paint on. You have to have some basis. And I usually have a pose. It's usually the basis for me. Like, it just intrigues me. I just like that pose or something. But I really, really have the whole painting all figured out, which is probably a detriment, because the more, the more you have figured out ahead of time, the better off you are, you know, because of the nature of the work. But you know what happens, like for instance this, um, I'm not even 100% sure, I have some ideas of what I'm going to go, it's not just going to be a straight, I have a couple of things percolating, and then during this part where I'm doing all like the, you know, the long tedious part, you know, that's when ideas just start coming to me, so usually the finalization, the painting, like the, what it really ends up looking like, some of those elements just really happen right at the end. Does the, does the color scheme that you can wear? Yeah, like they will change. It's, you know, yeah, they can change and they have. <laughs> they do something. Anyway, oh, one more. The, the, the young women in, your, um, in the exhibit, in, in the different pictures, were they, did they pose? Were they, um... Um, I have diff several different people or specific models that have posed for me. Right. Um, and then sometimes, I, uh, you know, sometimes it's where like somebody poses and then I kind of just, you know, at some point I'll just abandon the original thing and let my mind go with an idea. So, it, you know, it varies. But there are ones that are specific people, and it's, you know, yeah, a specific model. And 
Uh, one more. Okay, two more. Okay, wait. Go ahead. Hi, Nate. Hi. How are you? Hi, Nate. Um, do you ever, um, or have you ever, um, taken photos of different stages yeah. of your paintings so that you could see, even for yourself, how it evolves from the first, let's say you take 10 different stages? I you know I should do that more, and I did a little bit of like if you see in my show, there's that one panel where you do see like the stages, and you can even see where I changed like a big element. I mean that was like right at the end. I mean not the end, but <laughs> and this one I mean you know I I tried to take a couple, but I, what always inevitably happens is I sort of forget, you know. <laughs> but I should, and it is true. It's interesting. What I really like to do sometimes, I don't even know how to do this. I know. <laughs> no, I just want to. I just want to film the entire thing and then like speed it through in like a you know like a one hour. <laughs> the rain buns boil down in one hour. I'd like to see how that would work. But... I don't know. Is there any one other question? Thank you.